Actually, there were 1,255 great visuals in the Jetta Grove assembly, but the number is rounded off to 1,250 in all. These disciples comprised the Buddha's constant following. Formerly, most of them had to adhere to non-Buddhist paths, but upon receiving the Buddha's teaching, they were transformed. Moved by the Buddha's deep kindness, they constantly dwelt with him thereafter. Of the 1250, the Buddha first took across Anathagaudinya and the other four of the five bishus in the deer park. Next, he converted the three Kashyapa brothers who had been five worshippers. When they took refuge with the Buddha, they brought their thousand disciples along with them to also take refuge. That makes 1,005 disciples. Maudga, Liyana, and Shariputra each had a hundred disciples. They brought a total to 1,205. Then Yashas, the son of an elder, and his disciples took refuge for a total of 50 people, which makes 1,255 disciples in all. What is meant by a gathering? One person cannot count a gathering, nor can two, or two, nor three. It takes four or more to form an assembly. In this case, however, the gathering consists of more than 1,250. This is how Anathagawundina became the first of Shakyamuni Buddha's disciples in a former life. The Buddha was a patient immortal cultivating the way in the mountains. He cultivated the practice of patience in the face of insult. One day the king of Kinlinga went to the mountain on a hunting expedition, bringing with him a party of cucumbines, palace girls, ministers, and officials. While the king hunted, the concubines went for a stroll on the mountain and encountered the old big shoe, the patient immortal. The concubines who rarely left the palace had never before seen a, a person such a long beard and such hair as his. Although he was a cultivator, the concubines thought he was a freak and so they crept closer and asked him, What are you doing? I am working at cultivating the way I am practicing the Buddha Dharma, replied the old cultivator. The concubines had never heard the Buddha Dharma or even of the Buddha and were completely puzzled by his answer. Their curiosity got the better of them and each one had to come closer for a peek at the old cultivator. They crowded around him in a circle. By then, the king of Kalinga had returned from his hunting, only to find that his beautiful concubines had disappeared. He went looking for them and found them standing in a circle around a long-haired bearded man. The sight ignited the king's jealousy. He thought to himself, this man has seduced my beautiful women. They won't pay any attention to me, and yet he's managed to seduce them. Aloud, he asked, What are you doing? I am cultivating patience, replied the old cultivator. What do you mean by patience? Patience means that no matter what you do to me, no matter how impolite you are to me, no matter how badly you treat me, I can bear it. Really? said the king of Kalinga. Is that truly the way you are? I don't believe you can do it. If you truly have patience, why did you seduce my women now that they have become so involved with you and have fallen in love with you? In the future, they will certainly run away from the palace. No, I wouldn't seduce your women. I have been speaking drama for them, teaching them to be patient. Patient, 
speed back again. So you can be patient, huh? All right, I try you out. Let's see if you can be patient. And he dropped off the old cultivator's ear. Can you bear it? He shouted. Are you angry? I'm not angry, replied the old cultivator. Next, the king sliced off the cultivator's nose. Are you angry? He asked. Are your afflictions welling up? Don't you hate me? I haven't given rise to affliction, replied the old cultivator. Nor am I angry with you. Is that true? Are you really not angry? Screamed the king. Very well, I'll cut off your hand, which he did in one blow. You still don't hate me. The old cultivator, this previous incarnation of Shakyuni Buddha, said to the king of Kalinga, I don't hate you. Then I will cut off the other hand. And the king brought his sword down once again on the old cultivator. Are you angry? I'm still not angry, replied the old cultivator. Ah, you don't know truth from falsehood. Here, I cut off your foot. Now, are you angry? No, I'm not angry. The king cut off his other foot, which meant that he had severed all four of the old cultivator's limbs. You still don't hate me? He asked. The old cultivator replied, I still don't hate you. You're lying, cried the king. There isn't a person in the world who wouldn't get angry upon having all four limbs sliced off his body. I don't believe you really can be this way. At that time, the old cultivator made a vow. If I had if I have not given rise to any anger, he told the king, then my four limbs will grow back and my body will be whole once more. But if I have gotten angry, my hands and feet won't rejoin my body and my nose and ear won't grow back. As soon as he finished speaking, his hands, feet, ear and nose, which had been completely severed, grew back again. What kind of weird monster are you? The king of Kalinga cried. What kind of freak can make his hands and feet grow back on his body? A demon, the king concluded, addressing his party of ministers and concubines. But as soon as these thoughts arose, the drama protectors and, benefit, and beneficent gods let loose a hailstorm uh, that came beating down on the king. Then the old cultivator made another vow. Please, drama protectors and good spirits, don't punish him. I forgive him, he said. Then he told the king, In the future, when I realize Buddhahood, I will take you across to Buddhahood first. As a result of that vow, when Shakyamuni Buddha realized Buddhahood, the first person he took across was uh, Ain Nata Kaundina, who was none other than the former king of Kalinga. Upon realizing Buddhahood, the power of his vow led him immediately to the deer park to save the five pictures of whom the first was Ya Naka Undinya. When someone makes a vow, a connection is created. Therefore, you should make vows to be good to people and to rescue them. And you should be careful not to make vows to kill people. If you vow to kill people in the future, you people will vow to kill you, and there will be no end to the cycle of killing. If you make vows to take living beings across to Buddhahood, then they can all realize Buddhahood together, and everyone will obtain the bliss of the eternally still, bright, pure land. Be good to people, even if they are not good to you. We should have the kind of vitality that the patient immortal had when, far from getting angry, he vowed to save his attacker who was getting off his limbs. Students of the Buddha Dharma should imitate this spirit of magnanimity. magnanimity. Sutra, all work great are without our flows. 
disciples of the Buddha, dwellers and maintainers. They had fully transcended all existence and were able to travel everywhere and to accomplish the awesome department. Commentary, these great bhikkhus were not just great bhikkhus, they were bodhisattvas appearing in the bodies of bhikkhus. So it is said, inwardly they secretly practiced the bodhisattva conduct, outwardly they appeared in the bodies of sound hearers. So all were bodhisattvas at heart, so the fundamental, fundamental nature of the great vehicle was contained in their hearts. They outwardly practiced the dramas of the small vehicle and appeared as great ahas without outflows. A person who has attained the first version of the enlightenment is called a small ahat, while one who has attained the fourth version is called the great ahat. However, if an ahat who has attained the fourth version does not continue to grow and progress in his investigation, does not advance in his cultivation, he is called a fixed nature sound hero. He remains fixed on that level, he obtains a little and is satisfied. Although what he has is not much, he thinks it is sufficient and does not consider making any future, any farther progress. If he continues to advance in his cultivation, he can attain the position of Bodhisattva. This was the case with the great hearts of the Surakama assembly. As explained above, a heart is a Sanskrit word with three meanings, worthy of offerings without birth and killer of thieves. Why bishops can receive the offerings only of pupil, small ahas are worthy of the offerings of pupil and gods, such as kings of countries or of heavens. Great ahas are worthy of receiving the offerings not only of people and gods, but also of those who have transcended the world, that is, of those who have reached states beyond the six desire heavens. Great Ahas can receive the offerings of Bodhisattvas because they have cut off afflictions beyond the triple realm, whereas small Ahas have cut off only the affliction within the triple realm. So Great Ahat can be said to be Bodhisattva. Also, they manifest officials and do not practice the Bodhisattva way. Within the hearts, they have the magnanimity of bodhisattvas and they can gradually attain the level of bodhisattvahood. In past lives, they had already realized Buddhahood, wishing to keep Shakyamuni Buddha propagate the Buddha Dharma. They appeared in the bodies of bhikkhus to act as ahars. Basically, these ahars are great bodhisattvas. On a heart also is said to be without outflows. This means he has already attained the state of being patient with the non-production of dhammas. On a heart is also called a killer of thieves because he has completely killed the thieves of ignorance. People who have attained the fruition of the way have no outflows, no outflows of desire, no outflows of existence existence and no outflows of ignorance. Being without outflows, they do not fall into the three realms, the realm of desire, the realm of form, and the formless realm. We people all now dwell in the realm of desire. Also, we live on earth. We are utterly a part of the heavens of the desire realm. It is called the desire realm because the people in it have thoughts of desire and longing, which they are unable to stop. There are two kinds of desire, the desire for material objects and the desire for sex. By the desire for material objects is meant greed for all enjoyable things. For instance, if you don't have a house, you want to buy a house. Once you have a house, you think about buying a better one. That is the desire for houses. Or perhaps you want a good car, but first, Perhaps you buy a beat up car, but when you drive it around, people look down on you, so you decide to buy a better car. 
but you still do not invest in the latest model. Once you compare your cars with the newest model, however, you feel your present car isn't good enough, so you invest in a new one. That is the desire for cars. Eventually, your desire reaches the point that once you have the latest model car, you decide to buy an airplane. Once you have an airplane, you decide to invest in ships. The desire for material objects never ends. You never say, I've had enough. I'm satisfied. I don't want any more. I'm not greedy for any things. For any more things. Where does desire come from? It comes from ignorance. Desire for sex is something you would probably understand without my speaking about it. It refers to being greedy for beauty. It too cannot be satisfied. One wife is not sufficient. He has to have two. Then two are not enough. He needs three. Some men keep 10 or 20 wives. How do you suppose one person can respond to so many? Emperors often had several hundred or several, several thousand women gathered in the palace. Wouldn't you say that was extremely unfair? Now, in democratic countries, men are allowed only one wife. The practice of polygamy is prohibited, but there are still many people who sneak out and become involved in illicit affairs. Driven by their desire for sex, many men and women sneak out to carry on wanton relationships. They do not follow the rules. Besides the outflow of desire, there is the outflow of existence. This outflow occurs in the heavens of the form realm, which are beyond desire. By existence is meant the existence of everything and anything. People who are greedy for existence and cannot maintain control have outflows whenever there is a lot of something. The greatest of the three kinds of outflows is the outflow of ignorance. Ignorance is the basic root of affliction. With the outflow of ignorance, the outflows of existence and of desire arise. If ignorance disappears, of the other two are also cut off. Disciples of the Buddha. The Chinese word for disciple can also mean son, but here it refers not to Rahula, the Buddha's son, but to the great Bishus, the great Arhats spoken about above. The Brahman Sutra says, when living beings receive the, the Buddha's precepts, they enter the Buddha's position. When the state is identical to great enlightenment, they are truly the Buddha's disciples. Living beings who have received the Buddha's precepts have the, the qualifications necessary to realize Buddhahood. When their enlightenment comes, they are called disciples of the Buddha. The Dhamma Flower Sutra says, because they come forth from the Buddha's mouth and are born by transformation from the Dhamma, they are called disciples of the Buddha. What does it mean to be born by transformation from the Buddha's mouth, you ask, as a result of being taught and transformed by the Buddha? They became enlightened and thus were born from the Buddha Dhamma. For example, the day you took refuge with the Triple Jewel was your new birthday, be the beginning of a new life. Those of you who have taken refuge with the Triple Jewel are the Buddha's disciples. As dwellers, they dwelt within the Buddha Dharma, and as maintainers, they relied on the Buddha Dharma in their cultivation, specifically in terms of Sha. Shura Gamma Sutra, they dwelt in the treasury of the Tathagata and maintained the ultimately from Samadhi. You should protect and maintain the Sun Samadhi and not allow it to become scattered or lost. The term Abbot, one who has a monastery literally 
refers to someone who dwelt in and maintained the Buddha drama because it is his work to cause the Buddha drama to continue and not to be cut off. So hand it down and to allow it to spread, to perpetuate the Buddha's name. The Buddha's wife, like the great Ahas of the Suragama assembly, the Ahas had fully transcended all existence. That is the 25 realms of existence found in the triple realm and were able to travel everywhere and to accomplish the awesome department. They had the ability to live in any land in the ten directions, not just in our Saha world, because they were Ahas and had spiritual penetrations and transformations. They could fly or walk as they pleased. If they could go anywhere, why haven't I ever seen in America? You may ask. Even if they had to come to America, you should wouldn't have been able to see him or know of it because at the time the Buddha was in the world you hadn't even been born yet they were able to perfect the awesome department wherever they went they had an awesomeness that people feared and a department that people wished to imitate they are Deserving, they were deserving of respect because they differed from the ordinary in every way and they were respected by everyone they met. Ah, that person is truly fine, truly deserving of respect and admiration. Wherever the great bishops went, they did not look at him in proper things. They did not look at improper things. They would peer around like someone intent upon stealing something. Their eyes constantly regarded their noses, their noses regarded their mouths, and their mouths regarded their hearts. When they walked, their gaze did not extend beyond three feet in front of them. In this way, they returned to the light to illumine within. So awesome was their bearing that they never indulged in grudiness or horseplay, never giggled or joked. They were very refined and stern.